Hey, hey, everybody. If you're listening to this, you are listening to the first free hour of this episode of The Shift with Doug McKinty. If you like what you're hearing, please consider subscribing to the show in order to access the full feature-length versions of the podcast, as well as have access to the Members Forum, where we discuss potential topics and interviews and dive deep into the overall concept of The Shift. For only six bucks a month, not only do you get the full-length episodes, but also an opportunity to co-create with me, your host, Doug McKinty, the future of the show. Go to www.theshiftnow.com or patreon.com backslash the shift and sign up today in order to help make the shift possible. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Good morning, noon, or night, whenever and wherever you are listening, you are listening to The Shift. I'm your host. My name is Doug McKenty. This episode was recorded on March 25th, 2021. I'm pleased to announce my guest today on the program as technocracy researcher and doctor of philosophy, Julianne Romanello. Julianne was a professor with the University of Tulsa when the administration began a series of changes prioritizing STEM and building a future corporate workforce while reducing the emphasis historically placed on the liberal arts and individual intellectual cultivation. Confused by this transition, Julianne began to research the origin of the changes, only to find the vast network of public-private partnerships we now know characterizes the rollout of the coming technocratic state. Once aware, Julianne has become a tireless critic of technocracy and works to raise awareness concerning future plans to create a society characterized by social engineering projects that benefit the few over the many. Check out her work at www.heartsoverhexagons.com. Dr. Romanello is also an associate editor at VoglandView.com, a website dedicated to the works of philosopher Eric Voglin. Coming to prominence in the mid-20th century, Voglin had his own struggles with the rise of the postmodern establishment in academia during his time. His short essay, On Classical Studies, describes a frustration with an academy that taught sophistry over the Platonic ideal of individual enlightenment. In it, he describes how producing a climate of opinions had replaced the classical idea that reason and critical thinking should be considered a path toward personal growth. These notions foreshadow a future where the opinions of technocratic experts become the arbiters of truth, and personal critical thinking is reduced to deference to these authorities. Julianne's essay, Eric Vogelin's On Classical Studies, goes in-depth into this treatise, which provides a great introduction to Vogelin's work as a whole. As the apple does not fall far from the tree, it's easy to see how Vogelin influenced Dr. Romanello's own thinking, enabling her with the awareness to distrust the corporatist establishment and the strength to push back against the modern sophists inhabiting the halls of academia today. Stay tuned for this episode that will pinpoint the philosophical roots of the technocratic state, while using the concepts of Eric Vogelin to provide a context for the battle of ideas that pits those affected by the modern climate of opinion against those using critical thinking to form their own conclusions. Look for links to Vogelin's On Classical Studies, as well as Dr. Romanello's insightful and descriptive essay on the treatise, posted in the show notes below. If you like what you're hearing, please like and share this episode across your social media networks. We rely on listeners like you to distribute this information. For weekly updates and more about The Shift, go to www.theshiftnow.com and sign up for the newsletter. Many thanks to Dr. Julianne Romanello for appearing on this program, and thank you for helping to make The Shift. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this, the 74th episode of The Shift. Today, I am welcoming Dr. Julianne Romanello to the show. Uh, She is a doctor of philosophy, and um, she's been working, she had been working at the uh, University of Tulsa in Oklahoma when she discovered that there were a lot of changes taking place, and she looked into it and discovered everything that was happening in the background, which was uh, got into this whole um, tech- technocratic uh, great reset that's happening. And she was turned on to this a few years before COVID um, and already starting to um, call out against it. Um, and now that COVID's been happening, she's been, been becoming more and more of an activist. So welcome to the show, Julianne. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. And you want to just give my audience uh, a quick background, like 
you know, what, what was your perspective, what was going on and then what kind of woke you up to the fact that maybe something nefarious was happening in the background at the university of Tulsa? Yeah, sure. Um, so I was a visiting professor at TU. We, it's University of Tulsa, but we refer to it as TU. Mm-hmm. And there had been lots of talk of needing to sort of restructure departments and and look at the university's finances. And I would hear some of that. Um, there were committees looking at the value of of different programs and asking faculty members to give, you know, alignable um, program objectives and, you know, fill out these different kinds of forms that were were pretty tedious. So that was sort of going on in the background of the, uh, of the 2018, 2019 academic year. Mm -hmm. And toward the end in April, the end of the spring semester, there was a huge um, convening of the faculty where they were going to give some announcements about the future of the university. And it was, it it, it was unreal. (laughs) So you had just picture, and I hope your audience will indulge me here, but think of a, a university performing arts center, brand new one, Filled to the brim, standing room only, with faculty who were hearing all together and at the first time a new plan, which was entitled True Commitment. And it this plan was essentially destroying a, uni- a university that had a uh, 125 year history of being a liberal arts, uh, you know, academically oriented institution that had really a quite impressive faculty, especially in the 90s, 2000s, um, people producing a lot of, of nationally recognized, internationally recognized research. They, the Administration came out to say that all of that would be revamped and the University of Tulsa would cater to the needs of first generation college students. And that is a euphemism. It means, you know, students from um, lower income backgrounds, mainly minorities, right? And it was saying we are going to train them for the workforce. Well, you know, I, I'm a lover of learning for its own sake, and of course, people need to uh, people need to pay the bills. But you know, that's you don't go to university uh, for the same reasons that you would go to a technical college. Um, and I would hope that you know maybe students would have thought about that before they decided to pay the, the bills to go to TU. But anyway. If you can just imagine this entire auditorium of faculty just being floored to hear this, and they're saying we're cutting all these programs, cutting, and uh, the administration said, you know, we are rowing in unison. Mm-hmm. The board is ro- rowing in unison. Everyone is on board. We're going to do this. The students have voted with their feet. Uh, it's the it, I will be very honest and say it seemed like a Nazi rally to me. Right. I had that thought. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so that was, I was just shocked. Um, for the rest of the semester, I tried to fight with the faculty and with the students to say, hey, you know, you can't do this. People have signed up for one thing and you're flipping it on a dime. It's not good for the community. It's not good for learning. And so on and so on. But I really dug deep and then found out that the restructure of the university was to make it an anchor institution that would cap off a P20 pipeline. These are buzzwords that we can explain later. Okay. Um, and, and really become a force for surveillance and social engineering in our right. community and beyond. So that's, I was just appalled and 
and then I just could not stop looking into things. Yeah. Well, and that's, uh, you know, uh, I mean, first of all, I guess we can just say, I, uh, and I've, I've heard a couple of your other interviews, but right, uh, like a lot of what they're cutting then is the, is the knowledge for, for knowledge sake, the classical yes. education, uh, the philosophy departments, the literature departments, and they're promoting um, these jobs that they're expecting are going to be in the future, which are these science-based or computer science or, you know, something to do with artificial intelligence or blockchain or these kinds of things. These are the jobs mm -hmm. that are happening in the future. And you're so you're, you're right there working in the university and you're seeing they're restructuring the entire university right. in order to basically create workers for this, uh, and, and I think it's safe to say on this show, everybody knows what a technocracy is, but for this yeah. technocratic workforce of the future. Right. And, you know, some of our key areas in Tulsa and in Oklahoma, you know, every place has a regional economic plan uh, and the education system in, in every community across the U.S. is being align toward those workforce development goals and mm -hmm. and here in Tulsa we have cybersecurity we have aeronautics which is like drone research and of course and we have we're a huge drone man manufacturer and researcher yeah um and healthcare and they're doing you know all the stuff that you don't want to talk about you know uh, <laughs> because it's very dark but if you're going to be doing those types of things, cybersecurity, I mean, we, it's the University of Tulsa is, has a, the cyber core program, which feeds the NSA. Well, you want the, the professionals in those cybersecurity fields to have a well-rounded moral and ethical and historical uh, base of knowledge from which to make good decisions. And that's what they were taking away. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, so to me, it, it, on the face of it, I mean, the way it was presented, the language that was used, and uh, the, the broad contours of the plan looked to me just insidious. If they looked sinister. And I thought, how on earth are people not responding to this? But, you know, now I've become sort of used to that. But yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's they're, they're wanting to get rid of the disciplines that really encourage independent thinking. What, as you looked, as you looked into this, I mean, I guess one of the things that tipped you off is this jargon. So you keep hearing yes. the same jargon over and over again. Um, and I guess what's just so interesting to me, and, and I guess where I'm going with this would be the, the social engineering aspect of it, um, because you would hope that changes in a university or educational setting would be driven by the student body making choices. You know, this is what I'd like to learn. This is what I'm interested in. Um, but clearly what you're seeing is these institutions from above implementing what they perceive they're going to need uh in at some future point and then molding the students into what yes. they want the students to be um yes. you know at what point did you and and how so you started doing this research and how did you get to the place where you know you started feeling like wait a minute there's there's something going wrong here why did it feel wrong who were you seeing you know as the organizations that are responsible for these changes and um Again, you know what, I guess, you know, how would you see it as a social engineering project per se? Okay, well, oh, that's there are you have a lot packed into yeah, that question. Yeah. So I'll try to get to most of it and remind me if I've missed something. Sounds but, good. Um yeah, I think you know, you were seeing the language that was used at this rollout that I've described and then in subsequent emails and and you know I'm I'm actually an alumna of TU I did my undergraduate work there so mm -hmm. I received alumni emails also and so I got to see it from all different perspectives uh, but you would see yes the same language that was 
enforcing a sort of, or su suggesting enforcing, I, I don't, it's hard to pin it, you know, on that spectrum, but yeah, it was encouraging uh, a social justice ethic that had a, um, how do I say, I mean, it aligned perfectly with the sustainable development goals for the UN. Now, it took me a bit to make that connection that these were related to the SDGs okay. or impact tracking, but you would see the same language over and over and over again. And that's because these terms are coming down from an, really an international group of, of very wealthy, powerful people who have agreed upon these terms you know, or paid somebody else to develop them. Mm -hmm. And then they are trickling down to students through, especially through university administrations and leadership seminars and things like that. So just the repetition of, of terms that had to do with equity, inclusivity, and diversity, you know, um, all of the ones that you can Google and see, gender awareness, those were all there. And it sounded just cheesy to me. Mm -hmm. You know, and I hadn't been in the corporate world to become used to that kind of language. And and I had been very insulated. So it was particularly jarring to me. But that repetition of the language was was one thing. And how it was designed to shape thinking. Well, you know, one, one particularly disturbing uh, program that I saw at TU was a leadership program. It was the President, Presidential Leadership Fellowship Program, something like that, PLF. Anyway, it would, it would target uh, very civically engaged um, students who, who were bright, who cared about others um, and wanted to be leaders, you know, and those are all buzzwords. Well, this leadership seminar would, it, it would essentially tell students what positions they should take on issues of social justice. Mm -hmm. And it would just train them. And it wasn't, I mean, this wasn't even a high level training because I taught students, I taught in the honors program. So I had several uh, students who were enrolled in both the honors program and then this leadership seminar. And they said, you know, it's a bunch of fluff and we're just learning about how uh, we did, we need to extend educational access to say indigenous communities. Now I'm not, I'm not trying to criticize the effort to extend education. Certainly not. Right. But, it, but it's, important to understand that the terms that are being used they are not what we think about when we might say that and so by the repetition in this slow like over the course of a semester and then an academic year and then four years by this slow um, introduction of the new meanings of those terms there, you know, and from each different discipline that's hitting these students, then their ideas about what education is, they start to change. The ideas about what philanthropy is, what helping others, that they, they take a certain flair. And, you know, the people who were really responsible for these changes at my university, they were also the same people who were running foundations, the philanthropic foundations in right. our community, and all of the nonprofits. So you have to have, if you understand social impact finance, which is the economic mechanism of the Great Reset, they, the World Economic Forum talks about the impact economy. That's where we're headed. If you, if you know what that is and how it works, you have to have a, a sort of trusted community partner.
to give legitimacy to social impact programs. And those are those are social engineering programs. It's their community engagement programs where you have, say, this is just an example, college students going into impoverished schools and teaching uh, poor children uh, how to be empathetic, resilient, gritty, kind, and the rest. Right. And people say, oh, this is such a great program because, oh, you have a university backing it, and there are these great college students, and they're giving of their time and talent to help these poor, underserved children. Well, they are actually, and many times, most times, they are not, these college students themselves are unaware of what they're doing, but they are programming these younger children, in this example, to value certain uh, social justice goals, to have certain ideas about how our communities ought to work, what justice is, what faith is, any number of things. Mm -hmm. So it really creates a a large uh, self-reinforcing network of ideas that you know, if you go against those ideas, you are out. Right. Absolutely. I guess, you know, we're, we're running into this wall here and it's something that I, I want to, um, as we go on with the interview, I, I want to really kind of nail this down because the language is very challenging and it's challenging to even discuss to people the, I mean, essentially you and I do not trust the, the language the language sounds incredible. Uh, you know, we're gonna we're trying to educate impoverished people. We care about social equity. Um, we care about sustainability, and we see this over and over again um, with the World Economic Forum and the Great Reset and all of these philanthropies that are, you know, really just just trying to help out. Right? That's what they're trying to do. But we've but we. As we've dug deeper, and I think what I'm going to do at this point is is just let my audience know I have uh, interviews with Allison McDowell, so we've talked about the social impact investing, and Patrick Wood, where we've gone a little bit deeper into the larger concept of technocracy and and some of the history there, um, and so I can put those those uh, in the in the show notes those links so that people can get this kind of background because I could talk with Julianne all day about about how the technocracy is working and how this social engineering is, is infiltrating our, our schools. But one of the things that I really want, because she is uh, so well educated in philosophy and the history of philosophy is to kind of get into the background of, of the different lineages of philosophy that we're talking about here and exactly why I think this is going to help to answer that question of why the intentions of these people or really maybe are not as pure as it sounds. Cause it's so frustrating to talk about it because like people are going to say, Hey, Julianne, what you don't care about indigenous kids. What's your problem? You know? And it's I like, know. well, we do care, but we don't like the fact that these billionaires are actually assimilating these kids into this yes. larger technocratic vision that they have, because it's going to ultimately, uh, further empower them, further enrich them, and continue this divide between uh, upper and lower class. Yes. Yeah. So maybe it would be good for me to mention just a couple of of things that I noticed at first with the language that might okay. sort of get us rolling in that direction. I mean, you know, I mentioned just a few minutes ago that the reason the university was restructured was to create a P20 pipeline to the workforce. And that is basically establishing a skill set that's going to feed the needs of business and industry. And anyone who looks at their state educational plan can find that kind of language. But because I've studied, um, you know, language symbols and how they evoke certain um, certain states of consciousness and make us more or less aware of reality. Then I was mm -hmm. I was really struck by 
this uh, description of a, of a pipeline to the workforce. And because, you know, what do you ship in a pipeline? It's a commodity, right? And, you know, maybe this is the bleeding heart mother in me, but I thought you don't speak about students or any human beings as if they were a commodity to be pumped into a workforce. I mean, right. it sounds totally mechanistic. It's steely. It is, it, you know, if you imagine a pipeline, you know, what's in it has no agency of its own. I mean, that's the entire point of a pipeline. So, you know, I would, t I, I just almost instantaneously was struck by the reduction of, of human persons to a material substance that totally lacks its own, it lacks agency. So that got me, you know, just that realization got me attuned to the language. And, and when I started researching these things, um, you know, I just noticed it over and over again, impact, impact, impact. Like I hadn't seen that word used. I mean, in older usages, impact means literally a collision, a damaging collision of right. forces, right? Um, so, and it implies this motion, just like the pipeline, the motion. Um, you can really look at almost all of the globalist technocrat language and find that it is it is reductive to matter and motion and a physical metaphor. But, you know, I got into that because I had read the works of Eric Vogelin and I wrote my PhD dissertation on him. He was a, a political philosopher in the, in the 20th century. And he was in Germany. He was one of the only German uh, academics to have to flee non-Jewish, he was non-Jewish, to have to flee Germany because of his criticism of the Nazi regime. Mm. So he ended up coming to the U.S. on a, get this, a Rockefeller scholarship. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to dig deeper into that. I'm scared too, though. I know. <clears throat> um, but anyway, he came over and, and really fell in love with America, excuse me. <clears throat> because of our of a sort of very plain commonsensical language tradition that we had here and he had spent much of his academic uh, career his intellectual life trying to answer the question how on earth could so many people liberally educated um uh, as, you know, established in their communities and, you know, they weren't unstable people. How could you have so many smart, established uh, Christian or, you know, people of other faiths, how could these people tolerate the atrocities <laughs> that were being committed by the Nazis? Yeah. And he said, academics did not decry that violence uh, politicians didn't how on earth do we explain this and so then he started looking at the power of ideology and what is ideology it is a system of language language symbols that give us a what is essentially a second reality Right. So they obscure the first reality and present us with a new one. Okay. And and that new reality, uh, it it or the new picture of reality, the second reality, it cuts off certain um, certain experiences, certain knowledge that we would have by common sense. So by common sense, I would say you don't talk about human beings as if they're a commodity. But what ideologies do is they train you to ignore that uh, that 
hesitation right. that I would have. Yeah, and that, they present you with something else that that cuts off that that gut sense, or it could be a you know a logical reason, a uh, rational sense that says this this analogy doesn't work. And by bombarding you over and over again, then uh, you are you are acclimatized mm-hmm. to that ideology which is not true but it fits together very nicely and human beings like that yeah this is fascinating i've been thinking a lot lately about like what would our lives be like without tv um you know with this whole coronavirus thing that's going on i mean my personal experience and i think most people's personal experiences are that they may have known a few people who have gotten sick but you know they they don't know people that are dying left and right they don't you know it it i i think on that visceral level in your real life i don't know that the the average person would have thought we've all got to shut down we've all got to start wearing masks we all better social distance you know it, and uh but yet over the tv that's what they're being told over and over again and we're just seeing this, you know, clear impetus by the vast majority of people who are watching their TV that this is what everybody's got to do. This reality that I'm getting from my TV is more real than the reality that I'm experiencing in my real life, right? And what and what you're describing is essentially the same kind of what I would describe as a, a propaganda technique when you're hearing this same verbiage over and over again. It sounds great, but it's really getting you to bypass your common sense everyday reality and starting to believe that the world looks in this way that is this actually the second reality reality that's this ideologically driven reality and that's fascinating to think about um it's fascinating to think about that that these very wealthy individuals these people that run these think tanks and these um these philanthropic foundations and places like the world economic forum or the bilderberg group where very wealthy people and corporate ceos and bankers are meeting and politicians are meeting and they're coming up with these here's these ideologies you know agenda 21 where they come up with this verbiage and they know what they're doing because they're reading the same people that you are, you know, and, um, and they're doing it for the purpose of creating social change from this top down, from this top down vantage point, rather than allowing individuals to make choices for themselves from that common sense perspective, from that primary version of reality that we all have in our guts or in our heads if we choose to really apply our our own critical thinking to what's going on and instead like slip this in using this verbiage and saying it over and over again and even though it sounds great Mm -hmm. it's it's a reality that's really not your reality i mean that's interesting they're creating a reality for you and you don't even know that that's what's happening to you right and you know our our thoughts we think through language and images you know there i mean i i guess i haven't just tried to think without you know using language or images myself you know maybe in meditation but you know most of the time we are using those symbols mm-hmm. visual or oral um and and most people aren't aware of the power that those have to limit thought, to evoke certain thoughts, and to open us up to new perspectives, new horizons, or to constrict our horizon of reality. So, you know, an interesting thing about Vogelin, Vogelin talks about we have these primordial experiences, and he says every human being that is a human being has these. So that is, this is part of the essential structure of, of humanity and it's universal. So we all share this. We have an experience of four categories or concepts, really they're realities, but we can kind of group them. We have God, man, world, and society. Okay. 
So, and I think this is a really helpful tool to use, an analytical tool. Anyone can use it. You know, we all have these experiences, I'll say it again, of God, man, world, and society. And, you know, as Vogelin used the term, he was saying God to indicate not just a particular deity associated with a particular faith, but he was really trying to communicate something about this transcendent divine beyond that in our soul, uh, we, un- we perceive it there mm-hmm. and, and we don't have to get into like the divine ground of being, but it's an ontological <laughs> argument Yeah, that, you know, we are part of existence Um and the ground of existence, that is the foundation of it, we participate in that ground simply by virtue of existing. And, and he has volumes and volumes that explain that yeah. you know, much more precisely than I just put it. But, but we have this connection to something that's very beyond ourselves. And that's, it's a paradoxical experience. But it's, it's very important. And then we have the experience of man and that's our individual selves. And we can perceive other people as individuals and then God, man, world, you know, that's the whole of of physical reality and nature, um, things that are below God, but also beyond us in a way Mm -hmm. and society. And, and of course that would be you know, our cities, our nations that we understand to have a, a sort of spiritual significance and a rep- they represent a set of beliefs, of ideas, values, things like that. And Boglin says any, and I'll sort of wrap this up just to give, in case you need me to explain more, but um, he says we have these four primordial experiences And any language symbol, any text, any uh, work of art that ignores or tries to suppress one of those four categories. Okay. It is a, it's going to be a deformed symbolism because it's not true to how human beings participate in reality. So if you look at the my pipeline example. Right. Propaganda. Yes. And and the way you're talking about a certain set of human beings. So you know, you have these university administrators. You have people who work in a philanthropic foundation. Now they have the same primordial experiences of reality as the students that they're going to pump through that pipeline. Right. right? (laughs) But they talk about themselves as the, you know, the men manning the pumps or filling the tanks, directing the flow. Whereas these other human beings, you know, the students, they're, they're a commodity. They are reduced, you know, from they, there's nothing transcendent about those students. There's no participation acknowledgement of their participation in transcendence right or in other you know any of the other four categories i could go on you know but that's how it works and you and if you notice that some of these symbols are denying or neglecting one of those aspects of the larger picture then you ought to be aware and you ought to question why Mm -hmm. It sounds to me like um, as each each human being, each individual has these four aspects, and in order for the individual to grow as a human being, they need to learn how to engage individually with those four aspects. And if you take one of those away, then it's like you're giving this other entity the power over that individual is is what's happening. I, I, another thing that came to mind, let's see if this analogy kind of works, is that everyone is just is plugged directly into their own spiritual experience or their psychological experience. They can they're individuated. They can make choices for themselves. But 
when you take when you take one of these aspects away from your teaching then you're not you it it instead of teaching them how to be further individuated a stronger person making good healthy choices for themselves you're starting to get into that realm of indoctrination i think that's what we're we're getting to here like what's the difference between art and propaganda right what's the difference between education and indoctrination and I think what you're describing as what you perceived was happening at the University of Tulsa is that it was getting away from education and into indoctrination, yes. uh, you know, and and the language that was used was getting away from art, literature, philosophy, and starting to sound more and more like propaganda. Yeah. And, you know, one way you can look at it is, you know, I mentioned that we think through images and, and words. And if I speak about other human beings long enough as if they were um, a commodity or in the case of COVID, um, you know, vector of disease or right. whatever. Sure. You know, the longer that I pre present other people to myself in my mind as a vector of disease rather than acknowledging they too participate in a divine ground of being they too are part of the same society that i'm a part of like the community of humanity they too are as they too have the you know whatever it is that makes us want to preserve the planet and and protect against climate change and i'm using the globalist example there on purpose Mm -hmm. that these other human beings have that same essential feature to them. But if I use language symbols that deny the, um, the, the full and the special situation of other human beings, then I can treat them as if they were, you know, um, a lesser of a lesser status or I don't mind to, you know, lock them up and say, you're right. not allowed to have this. You've got to eat your synthetic meat. You have to take this jab because I say so, you know? Yeah. And, and so when you control the language and, you know, philosophers since the day of Plato have been talking about this. And I had just been thinking about Joseph Pieper. He's a Catholic philosopher who talks about the abuse of language and, the abuse of power. When we use language that alienates people from others or from themselves, like you were saying, you know, that um, it, instead of trying to o allow other individuals to make their own decisions and explore reality and approach it in wonder, Mm -hmm. When we cut off their ability to do that and simply put ideas in their mind, even when we have the idea that that would be appropriate, you know, then we're engineering, you know, matter for our own motion rather right. than. In, instead of helping a student along their own path to learn about life by making their own choices and helping them to become a, a better thinker, uh, you're instead you're just feeding them, indoctrinating them with the propaganda that's going to get them the job, you know, for the corporate, yes. right? <laughs> yeah. So you know, you yeah. tell these, you tell students, you say, well, what matters is that you get a good job. You know, what matters is your material success. What matters is your rep reputation. Mm -hmm. What And you never talk about, say, the soul as an independent reality. Right. You, know, you just ignore it. And when now you can't talk about the soul in every single college class, right? Like there are different <laughs> times and places for these things. But when there is a deliberate effort to cut off conversation about say the soul or say about uh, the justice of the U.S. Constitution or colonialism or relations with indigenous people. When you try to cut off, deliberately cut off some 
aspect of of a conversation or, or or a topic that is evidence of of bad intention and trying to control rather than engaging in an open and respectful inquiry into the nature of things right you know and, and so you're going to end up with this untrue ideology or that's it's a constriction um rather than you know what's real right it's so fascinating to think about this like literally imposing an an alternative reality on top of everybody's just everyday lived experience by by cutting off (laughs) their ability to reason for themselves about that experience that they're having and imposing on top of that some kind of reality that's dictated um, by the people that create the ideology, you know, clearly, yeah. clearly manipulative because they wouldn't be creating an ideology if they didn't want to, use, you know, if they weren't using it to empower themselves, that these are controlling people. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think one thing that, I don't know, distinguish me from a lot of other people who witnessed this happen was I think I t- I take the possibility of of evil seriously. Yeah. You know, and right. and I think anyone who reads history seriously understands that human beings are capable of very dark things, you know, and I I don't believe we've made moral progress on that, you know, like certain individuals do, but as a race of human beings, like that is a perennial challenge that we have is to overcome the urge to do dark and evil things. And, you know, if I am looking at Vogelin's analysis of reality, when you're talking about God, that symbol, again, it's, it's a large symbol. It's, it designates things that are beyond human control, beyond, you know, anything that, that right. we could create. And there in, included in that is this possibility of a, of a real evil force. So, you know, if I think that I had always taken evil seriously, um, Many people don't. I mean, I'm thinking of what is it, the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. I don't know if anyone's read those. But, I haven't. You know, C.S. Lewis is wonderful, and and he has. There's a bit in there where he, he talks about the you know the devil. His greatest trick was getting people to doubt his existence. Right. Right. right yeah. You know. So unless you believe that there are there is the potential for a dark force and you don't have to call it the devil or Satan or anything like that, but just chaos, Ananke, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can understand the people at the very top of this without that. Right now, you know, it is. So those are, I think your transhumanist social engineers at the very top, your Harari's, your Klaus Schwab's even, and the people, I'm sure that there are people above them. Right. You know? Yeah. Those are the guys that I think really have a longing for destruction. You know, I think that they enjoy it. And I think that that is an evil force. But well, then it trickles down. Controlling. And, and, mm-hmm. Well, just controlling behavior. We were talking a little bit about the psychology beforehand. And I think, uh, you know, one of the, one of the characteristics of narcissism Yes. Is controlling, <laughs> manipulative, controlling behavior. And that's, I mean, you know, like if you, people who become billionaires and mega billionaires, they have c- uh, clearly, you know, narcissistic tendencies, right? I, you can't so, be a nice person and a billionaire, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty. I mean, you, can, you can't. A millionaire, maybe, but a billionaire, you yeah. cannot be a nice person. You have to be ruthless. And I think you have to be. You have to be dull or insensitive to 
some of these aspects of reality. Right. Like you have to be able to look at other people as as objects. Yeah, exactly. Just the kind of people that we were talking about that would that would engage in this kind of objectification of the people beneath them in the social yes. order. Uh, and then the kind of people that would create ideologies to control people's, even their very sense of reality. I mean, that's what's fascinating yeah. about this conversation is, is how this language then can control your own ability to perceive reality, the reality in the world around you. And it, and yeah. it takes your decision making out of the equation and you're having this reality imposed on you and you don't even know it. And you think the reality sounds great, you know, right? It's talking about <laughs> sustainability and equity and social justice. Um, well, and, you know, equity is a great example because it's a slight shift from equality. Right, right. right. So it sounds just similar enough to where we think, oh, yeah, equality, where we all human beings are created equal at a, at some fundamental level, you know? I mean, if you just look at, say, our founding documents and the sort of political religion that we have, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. You don't have to go any farther than that because it says that we hold it to be self-evident. Um, so you play on this this value that we hold across the political spectrum and that we hold nationally and globally, you know, I mean, Europe and South America, every, you know, this is mm -hmm. standard, but you shift to equity, just a slight shift. And people are going to just assume that it means equal. In right, just just sense. like in the Declaration of Independence, right? Except, yeah, it's still yeah, just a little different. <laughs> yeah, right. Because equity is about measuring. It's about measuring sameness and measuring resources, and controlling, dis you know, distributing them e equally. Right. That's what equity is. So, just like sustainability, I mean, I don't know. I need to research the history of of that term in particular to see like why it was chosen. But mm -hmm. you know, we've heard it taught so much on Earth Day celebrations and whatever. You know, oh, sustainability means you know, care for the environment. Well, it doesn't mean that. You know, sustainability means a a sort of a reflexive feedback loop or a self-perpetuating system. So when you hear sustainable economic development, a lot of us think, oh, well, this is, you know, this is business that does not harm the natural e ecological systems. Mm -hmm. I think that's what most people think of. But sustainable economic development means that you know, it really means that you're going to have a, an, the potential for economic, for capitalizing on economic activity ad infinitum. You know, you're never going to run out of the possibility of expanding your market. And how do you do that? Well, it's by, you know, creating markets that, move into the virtual world well <laughs> where right. people can <laughs> they can consume as much as they want without <laughs> you know like diminishing our planetary resources because it's none of it's real it's in right. our headset yeah, isn't that fascinating? Like beyond ideology now and straight into the virtual world is where is where they're taking it now with the with the technocracy. Yeah. Or you create markets for trauma, you know, and you have these feedback loops. So you traumatize and then you offer here, there's your Hegelian dialectic. Right. right. You know, your problem <laughs> reaction solution. You traumatize and then you offer a a sort of fix for trauma but you don't you don't fix it all the way or 
into the fix is built some other traumatic experience that's going to have to be fixed later. So that's your sustainable economic Yeah, and there's profit on out. every layer of, of trauma, then healing the trauma and trauma and healing the trauma, and they're taking their, yes. their profit. Yes. Yeah, that's what, that is crazy. It's, it's crazy nuts. to think about. <laughs> I want to um I want I want to take the conversation because we were talking about Vogel and, and I'm really enjoying this um this the philosophical difference between like like art and propaganda like we were talking about in education and indoctrination mm-hmm. and I know that Vogel was really influenced by Plato and in particular the Socratic dialogues and so I, because I this conversation has been going on for for 2000 years right for 2500 yeah. years like what is the nature of reality what is the nature of truth what is an ethical way of dealing with our fellow human beings and there have always guess what there have always been for 2500 years these rich guys that are trying to justify propaganda and indoctrination and controlling of the masses of the lower classes and then there have been those who have been standing up and saying no we're all individuals. We all have our own spiritual experience. And human beings need to be given the freedom to, to make those choices for themselves and to follow their own spiritual paths and, and um, you know, to, to walk their own walk. Um, and in Plato's time and in the Socratic dialogues, there's a lot of discussion between Socrates and this lineage of, of philosophers in ancient Athens called the Sophists. And so I want to understand what is sophistry and what was that interaction like between Plato and sophistry? And then I think we could bring it back to Vogelin too, if you like. Yeah. Well, so, you know, the sophists were foreign teachers of rhetoric. They were coming into Athens. Athens was historically in turmoil. Um, You know, they... Excuse me. They were going through some political upheavals, and society was changing, and they were um, dealing with conflicts with Sparta. And you know, you saw these foreign uh, teachers come in and say to the wealthy men of Athens, "If you pay me a modest fee, which really wasn't so modest." Right. <laughs> then I will educate your sons in, in virtue. And I mean, that there's already a sort of slip of the tongue there because the, this office did not intend to like create virtuous young men. Um, so they were really li- sort of lying to the fathers, but they were, they were, they said, we can, train your sons to be uh, successful in politics, you know, and mm. that's not the same thing as virtue. I mean, as, I think difference. we all know that. Yeah. <laughs> that's a key difference between say uh, Socrates as he's portrayed in the dialogues. And then the sophist is that for Socrates, that we have an enduring permanent universal standard of virtue and that's knowledge. It's truth. Mm-hmm. So truth is objective, whereas for the sophists, truth, um, it depends on the circumstances. It depends on the regime. It depends on your audience. It depends on what you want in life. Right. So the sophists said, you know, we can train your young men to be virtuous, which really means to be successful in politics and to be successful in uh, democratic Athens means what well it means you have to be elected by the people and so you have to do what it takes to get elected so you had these foreign teachers coming in and saying we can give your young men the skills to be elected and to get power and you know they taught them basically how to flatter a democratic audience. And that was what, you know, was portrayed as virtue. And, right. You know, so you had people learning how to, you know, twist words. And, you know, there is um, Aristophanes wrote uh, 
one of his comedies, The Clouds, and it mocks Socrates and and it has a father who has a lot of debts and he's like, oh, you know, he's got this son who's a spoiled brat and he's like, I'm going to take him over to, I'm going to take my son over to the thinkery and and he's going to learn how to win arguments so that I don't have to pay back any of my debts. Right. See, I, there's so much to learn from these things, you know? And Aristophanes portrays Socrates as heading the thinkery. So Aristophanes is criticizing Socrates. He's basically calling Socrates a sophist. Right. But why it's in, it's important to go back to Aristophanes is because you can see um, you know, this caricature of, of the sophists, and that is they're people who get paid to uh, teach others how to manipulate their words for power. Now, I think there are there are some important reasons why why Aristophanes would criticize Socrates. I don't I don't think that Socrates was a sophist by any means, but it is Socrates and his objective standard of truth. Um, and encouraging every individual to test his or her reasonings, um, never to rest with the majority opinion, you know, always to question tradition um, and myth and, and even things that are held to be sacred. You know, you're always supposed to question and to have a healthy skepticism, not resting on your own, um, what could be a, a false opinion of things. Mm-hmm. That practice of philosophy, it, it is dangerous to political order, right? <laughs> um, right. <laughs> and Aristophanes, I think, noticed this. And so, you know, he, he sort of goes after Socrates. But, you know, this is the situation that, that I think we all are faced with today. I mean, Plato writing about Socrates and his games, and of course, Plato says Socrates was engaged, he was teaching people to think for themselves and to liberate themselves from these, uh, these incorrect political systems and, you know, ways of thinking that would hold everyone back. Um, I think Plato does such a wonderful job of portraying this real battle for the soul of young people, especially. Mm-hmm. I'm 40. <laughs> so I'm like sort of set in my ways now, but you know, my young kids are not right. And so it, it really is a battle for young people's souls, I think. Uh, but it's, are you going to teach them to think for themselves and to, and this is a phrase that you can find in a good translation of, of Plato's work, mind their own business, understanding that our own business is really the correct order of our thoughts. and Interesting, actions. yeah. Are we going to do that or are we going to be focused on controlling others for what? For power. Right. And that's sustainable development right there. You learn techniques of power for what? For power. I mean, that's it. It's a a feedback loop. Whereas if you look at philosophy as a a pursuit of the truth, not only does it not take away from someone else's pursuit of the truth, you know, it's not a zero-sum game. But it also has a definite trajectory that gets us out of that feedback loop. You're always trying to move closer toward um, an accurate understanding of what's real. Well, and well was, this whole process of social engineering, it, it just takes that away. It says, don't right. worry about that. It What matters is the power. And that was one of the, am I correct in saying that with the Socrates' philosophy or the Platonic view of things, 
that, uh, you know, because you, you hear this phrase from Socrates, all I know is that I know nothing, yet there's this emphasis on reason, but it's always, there's always a, this pursuit that's going on. And so it's, I, I've always found it to be really humble at the same time. I mean, you're, you're, you're minding your own business. You're dedicated to using <laughs> reason for yourself. And, and there is an objective notion of truth, but still you're, you know, you're always, you can always be better at it. You can always continue to work at being better at it. And that's one of the things that, because to me, then the sophists are always trying to pretend like my logic is better than yours. And so I'm right, you know, and that, and, yeah. and that they've, they, it, it's so interesting to get into because on the one hand, I think that Socrates then is actually allowing you to tap into your true sense of reality and the sophists are indoctrinating you uh, with this second layer, the second reality uh, and their and their sophistry, their reason is really just propaganda. Uh, yes. And it can sound very slick and very well reasoned out, but it's not you know, you're not, it's not allowing you to tap into yourself in that same way. And it's, it's just, it's interesting because it's almost like the objective reality flips, like, yeah, you know, Plato's talking about the objective truth, but he's never arrogant enough to think that he's getting there or that he can impose his truth on somebody else's path on their journey, you know? Um, whereas the sophist will say that they've discovered the truth um, but they, and we're going to teach it to you. Yeah. And then, yeah. I mean, but this then is, they, and they haven't, and then they'll say, but the truth can be, you know, is the truth is the good argument. It's not, there is no objective truth. Right. I mean, we hear that from the postmoderns right now, you know, yes. it's coming back to the modern age. The same argument is actually still going on. Right. Yes. And the postmodernists are saying, well, there's no objective sense of truth. So yeah. My argument is better than yours, and so yeah. we're going to do things my way. <laughs> I know. Well, if you look at if you look at the current buzzwords, when you hear personalized and adaptive systems, that's what they're talking about. An right. adaptive system, it's always in response to. It. So, you know, it's always conforming to this. What you know, this personal, you know tailored to you based on all of your signals intelligence that you've ever emitted your whole life and your right. DNA record you know. the data collection yes so it's totally personalized like it's it's subjective in a way that it you know we are radically isolated from each other um but then you have these programs that you know they just respond to you and change you in the process and then it just keeps going right isn't so that that's, wild i know like, so that's really in the technology in the technocracy the algorithms are going to be your personal they're going to create your own personal propaganda just for you so yes you know? yes and it will change and so as you've been propagandized you know because it's a process you know this is like your heracliton flux you know you can never step into the same river twice and right. this stuff goes back millennia um but yeah that's how it works it's like where the propaganda is gonna just keep responding and responding and responding and really i mean it's you know that's so in cool. that relationship in that dynamic we're training the, the ai you know i mean it's you have to think about it that way and, and its goal is to liberate itself from us but to bring it back to like right. a maybe a more concrete level where you started that question. Um, I think it really good. I think where we find the real difference between say Socrates and the sophists is on the issue of our of tolerance of or openness to mystery or paradox. Mm -hmm. So like you say, this yeah. is a paradox where, you know, Socrates can talk about some sort of objective truth, but he's always in pursuit of it. And he claims ignorance because he understands that it is, it transcends him. Yeah. It is not something that a human being, one human being in time 
or any human being or all human beings at all times could ever possess. It's not something, it, it's beyond us. So that's where Vogelin is really uh, helpful with his rubric of the God-man world society. You know, human beings have this primordial experience, a deep experience in our soul. And, and that is, you know, our consciousness. It is a deep sort of mystical connection to this ontological ground. It's, you know, it's a, it's a rich concept that, that is, is discussing there. But in our soul, we have this apperception of something that is totally beyond us and that we will never control, but that we can know in some way, like in, as, as through a glass darkly, you know? Whereas the sophists are limiting that. They're saying there is no beyond. There's only the here and now. There's only the present. So they're, uh, they are constricting reality. They're taking, they're like lopping the, the divine dimension of reality off. And they're saying it's only the here and now. And we can control that. So you have Socrates who doesn't want to control because he understands that the structure of reality precludes that kind of control. Right. And then you have the sophists who are saying, we, we can control the whole thing because we've lopped off the <laughs> transcendent um, level or pole of reality. Um, and I guess, you know, to bring it back to Vogelin, like Vogelin was, he would say, well, why did you have so many decent, educated people allow these atrocities? And he says, well, because they have essentially lopped off part of reality. Hmm, right. They're not and, connected to the transcendent any longer. And right. so they're only connected to this ideology. Yes. Yeah, so this imminent version of, where um, the locus of order is. Okay, so you could look at the state, the nation state, uh, Germany as being the locus of ontological, spiritual, intellectual, cultural order. Well, if you say that the state is the highest and right. You know, and you've lopped off something bigger than the state, then that helps you to justify to yourself or to excuse these aggressive acts that otherwise, you know, we would say these are terrible things to do. Yeah. Right? Um, and so Vogelin says, well, why, you know, why would they have this constricted? version of reality or how do we how do we res allow propaganda to form us in this way and where I think Vogelin is really really great he I think anyone who wants to understand our current situation would really enjoy reading Vogelin because he talks about this existential anxiety that we all have and he doesn't do this like from a Sartrean point of view. He does this from, you know, looking at the history of philosophy, the history of consciousness, and how our language symbols have progressed. And he, I, he's looking for the the one constant in human experience. And for Vogelin, he says, well, it's these. It, the one constant is our effort to articulate in language. And to, and that is a part of the process of trying to understand this uh, these experiences that we have of God, man, world, and society. So, what is like the universal human characteristic? We have these experiences, and we want to understand them. Right. And we know that we can't understand them all the way because there are these components of of transcendence that are built into that. You know, we cannot fully understand nature. 
You know, we're different than nature, but we participate in it. So we know, but through a glass darkly. So there's your mystery. Yeah. And some people, and it, and this is a mystery too, they're more tolerant of, of that mystery. Whereas others, they sort of experience this angst about it. Sure. I have these experiences of things that are bigger than me, but that not being able to control these things or really not being able to fully unpack that mystery, it causes this angst because you know that you don't control your, your life. Right. Yep. So what do you do? You look for a drug, you know, you look for, um, a sort of spell or a magic that will make sense of it. And that's where these ideologies come in. That's where the sophists come in. They say, we can control it. We can bring order to it. And that's what our social engineers are trying to do. Yeah. It's just They're so amazing. Order. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I love this stuff. I love to be able to discern the difference between these two philosophical traditions and what's really going on. And, and this is the heart of it. I mean, we can go from here to like, well, what is virtue, you know, from the Platonic point of view, virtue would be accepting the mystery, you know, yeah. and having courage in the face of that mystery. And yes. and then, but then from the Sophist point of view, you know, the virtue is like to, to control, to have discipline and control, you know, and, yeah. and break through that mystery so that you don't, you know. Yeah, it, it's like creating order versus... It, right being open to it i mean it gets very complicated you know sure <laughs> it's much more subtle than these broad strokes that i'm sort of fumbling through here but but yeah i mean it, i think what what where vogelin can really help us out is helping to us to see the symptoms of what is really a psychological disorder he uses that term you know, a soul disorder, um, and under, and he helps us to see that just by giving a name to it, you know, saying this is a psychological disturbance when we're cutting off aspects of reality, you know, right. when we are prohibiting questions, when we're doing these kinds of activities, you know, he, this all goes back to a sort of or angst where we want to and this is a probably the most famous thing that anyone who's ever heard of Vogelin will remember it's he had a phrase don't immunitize the eschaton and it, <laughs> and it was on the cover of time magazine so that's another oh scary wow thing yeah I yeah told you rockefeller and then time magazine and oh that's a new world order rag right there right. um but don't immun don't bring the final culmination of, of reality as a process, don't bring that into a man-made reality. Right. Like human beings cannot engineer well, a, a perfect order. It's beyond us. We're imperfect beings. That brings me to another Greek concept I wanted to bring up in this context, which is the notion of hubris, right? When you start to think that you can control it, that's when the the tragedy happens, right? Or the totalitarian dictatorship that ends up killing, you know, half a million yeah. people or millions of people or or whatever. I mean, this is this is that arrogance that comes because you've you've separated yourself from the mystery. You believe that you have control. I think another good analogy is the Frankenstein monster, right? I mean, you think you can control life, but yeah. instead you just create this this monster that really uh and that is what I'm afraid that's what we're experiencing now with COVID, right? Or this and yeah. as they bring on this this technocratic transition that they're pushing for, this is their hubris, their belief that they they have control. Uh, and they're, but they're not perfect, right? And they're, and they're going to create a Frankenstein monster and it's not, it's going to end up doing way, way more harm than good. I mean, it's just the, it's just the same old story, right? I know. And, (laughs) you know, I mean, I think it is, I think it's helpful to say that, you know, you have these guys at the top who are, you know, 
they are the ones who are really trying to engineer something that most people have no idea about, like right. the transhumanism and, you know, who knows, colonizing space worlds and all kinds of right. weird things like that. Um, I mean, they're trying to be gods, essentially. But then sure. I, I it, think there is actually an immortality component to this. They want to oh, upload yes. themselves into machines and live forever. I mean, you know, uh, yes, they do talk like, about it, hubris. <laughs> it's nuts, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, you have these patents for the Microsoft chat boxes. <laughs> have you seen that where you can you can have a conversation with a deceased loved one? Oh wow. <laughs> so, you know, and I think probably the guys at the top are selling that kind of technology because they want to, you know, they want to have all po all human possibilities under their control. So they really want everyone to like upload their mind so that the guys at the top, they can pick and choose like the best of everyone. Yeah. But for those of us who are way down the totem pole, you know, um, and don't have those kinds of, really exciting adventure book type fantasies, you know, they play to our sense of what just controlling our health. So, you know, they have transhumanism as a goal, but we have, you know, the people who are watching the news and who are following the guidance of their corrupt health departments. You know, these are people who are very risk intolerant. And we can look at yeah. risk and mystery as similar things. Right. Interesting. Right. Totally. You know? Yeah. So you have, I mean, you look across corporate America. It's all about risk management right now. And how do we control and how do we prevent things? How do we prevent what? Uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And when you look at what technocracy is trying to do, I mean, it is a risk management model it's a pre you know what is it minority report with the pre-crime totally yeah that's what this is and and it appeals to us even though we're going to be enslaved by it i mean i'm you know i didn't know i say i'm not but i'm already it's hard to go to the grocery store right yeah um, and we'll see what happens when you know for the people that aren't vaccinated or whatever i mean how is that <laughs> how is that going to work yeah. out they're, yeah. they're definitely, uh, I We're think going to be geofenced and, but you yeah. know, I think, well, at least I still have my, my natural DNA. Yeah. You know, <laughs> at least I've, I, I've said I'm not, you know, but that all of that aside, you know, this, uh, the libido dominandi, this will to power that, that is present in every human soul. Yeah. The ability to quest for the truth is there, but the ability to quest sort of for its opposite, you know, or to love its opposite, that's there too. That's that potential for evil that mm -hmm. not enough people take seriously, in my opinion. I, I was going to ask one more question, I think, which is because Vogelin, you know, he was struggling with staying in academia, but he ultimately felt like he was, he stayed in, you know, he wanted to try to make the changes from within. But you're and you're not you're working in academia anymore, right? I mean, no. Maybe we're looking for a different path at this point. It seems like the institution has been totally taken over by these technocratic forces. I mean, it's just what yeah. what's the next step? You know, where do you think you go to 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 learn these kinds of ideas now? I mean, I think you know. I, I think if people are looking for a way to fight back against this technocratic force, like one of the best tools that we would have would be to pull out of the education system altogether yeah. and really to ruin it. I'm, we are not participating. So that I think is, it's offensive and defensive. Um, and that doesn't go to the question that you asked, but I think as far as a resistance effort and resistance efforts are always going to illuminate truth you know just by fighting disorder we we actually reveal order i i believe yeah 
I think that's great advice, frankly. I I just I I mean I I don't think I told you before, but I I uh, homeschooled my kids too, and I'm just getting to a place where it's like, you know, what they're teaching and how they're teaching now. It's it's just going back to our conversation. It's propaganda. It's indoctrination. It has nothing to do with education. Don't participate, people. You know, content. Yeah, I mean, there are no facts. They're really teaching people to be compliant and Mm -hmm. stuff like this but so you know to your question like where if we destroy those institutions and i i feel that we must yeah um strategically and you know for the health of of our souls um we're gonna have to create something new and and i think it's going to look a lot like in the Hellenistic era, you know, you had people meeting in in homes. You know, you had times when, say, different religious faiths have been persecuted, and and you met in private places and developed those small communities, and then people a, a wider base they were sort of drawn to it, and I think that that's where we're going to go now, and it it makes me sad, you know, because yeah. I, I, I liked when I went to the university, it really was a, a time of great flowering. I think, you know, it was, it was a really beautiful, <laughs> precious time. And, and I'm sorry that my children won't have that and that other people's children won't, but I think we're going to have to just be brave and suck it up and say, we don't know what it's going to look like, but we we know that human beings have always gone on. We've had this fight for 2,500 years, yeah, longer, and you know we j- we have to stick with what we know, and and we do know that it's right to preserve those things that make us human. So, absolutely, we'll find a way. <laughs> It's going to be messy. <laughs> yeah, it will be. It will be messy. But that's all right. It's always a little bit messy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to let people know where they can find out more? Where should people go to find out more about your work now? Oh, sure. You know, I I have recently kind of started a website. It is www.heartsoverhexagons.com. Okay. And you know, hexagons are a common shape that these guys like to use. So that's why I put hearts over hexagons. Okay, cool. And people can find my things there. Or I have a totally public profile on Facebook. And I really use Facebook a lot more because I can do quick things. And with four kids, that's right ideal. But um, so I can't really friend any more people because I'm at my limit. But you can always, you know, read posts. And I've got lots of smart friends that comment and stuff. Yep, I've been enjoying it. I've been enjoying <laughs> checking out your posts and getting getting get ready group. for this interview. And it is it is a great group, actually. I one night I did my interview with Allison McDowell, and then I kind of actually got in with all you guys. I think that's how I got connected with you. And um, I've I've friended so many people in that whole scene now, and I'm loving it. <laughs> it's actually it's made nuts, a pretty big difference. It? Yeah, and it's great to have yeah. um, just really good enlightened conversation about what's going on with everybody. So. So, um, yeah, I've been enjoying that. You can find Julianne on Facebook for sure. Um, and I'll just let people know that you have been listening to The Shift. I'm your host, Doug McKenty, and you can find my stuff at www.theshiftnow.com. Uh, I'm also on Facebook, which I do have a Shift Facebook page under The Shift, but as my personal page has kind of taken off, you can just find me on Facebook under Doug McKenty as well. And I am on Twitter at McKenty, uh, or you can just look up the shift with Doug McCanty and uh, you can find me on the various podcast uh, distribution sites. And I'm on a lot of other social media sites as well. Minds and float and gab and, and uh, a couple of others, but um, go into the website. The shift is the best place actually, and sign up for the newsletter. And then I'll just send you all my new content as it comes out. So thanks everybody for listening. And thanks, Julianne. That was really a sweet conversation. I had a great time. I love talking I philosophy and um, 
I really enjoyed getting to know uh, Eric Vogelin's work a little bit. And I think it really came together. I mean, it would just put everything in context in terms of the history of philosophy and in terms of these different ways of thinking. And I, and I hope that uh, the people that are listening to this got as much out of it as I did, because um, I think it really helps put things in perspective and helps you understand you know, these different philosophical concepts, because they are having a huge impact on our life, especially right now, right? It's not just something that you're learning in, in a philosophy class in, in college. It's like, these concepts are affecting our everyday lives in a big, big way right now. So understanding what's happening is really important. So thanks again for helping to elucidate my audience with uh, the understanding of, of these philosophical concepts and making making them clear and understandable for people. So it's my pleasure. Thanks so much. Keep fighting the good fight. Always. <laughs> All right. Take care. Thanks. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, that was my conversation with Dr. Julianne Romanello. Um, what a, an incredible interview. I thought actually that was one of the most fun uh, interviews I've had. It kind of reminded me uh, of the John Perkins interview I did way back on uh, public radio here in Mendocino County, uh, the author of The Economic Hitman, and we had a conversation uh, that really kind of got to the heart of what he was doing as an economic hitman. And I, I think this, uh, this conversation I had with Julia was kind of the same. I was able to go really in depth uh, into a lot of these concepts with her, but the conversation still had a flow to it, and, uh, and we were really able to kind of have a, a beginning and a middle and an end and, and come to a conclusion. And Really, what a doozy of a conclusion that was for me. I mean, I as I'm talking to her, I'm starting to realize that in the history of Western philosophy, there's basically always, and it just makes so much sense. There's always a, a you know a dark side and a and a good side, uh, and it's typified in uh, Plato's uh, legendary battles with the sophists of his time. But then we're hearing the stories of uh, Eric Vogelin, who was dealing with it in the academy at his time, and, uh, and of course, uh, Julianne's own struggles at the University of Tulsa in dealing with the, the technocrats, the new sophists of our time. And um, it, just, uh, it just really um, kind of got me that this kind of back and forth between does a human being have critical thinking skills for themselves and is the point of an education to teach someone how to use reason and critical thinking uh, to become uh, a powerful personal individual that can make choices for themselves? Or do we teach people how to make uh, really good arguments, get hired by the wealthiest people of the society uh, to basically use technical jargon to convince us uh, that we should do what the wealthy want us to do. Uh, it's just an age-old battle, and it, it was happening in ancient Greece, and it's happening again now. And then to be able to use Vogelin's work as a backdrop, and I hadn't known this guy before, so it was really cool to get a chance to read, uh, to read his essay and uh, kind of get to know his work a little bit, because he had this idea of the climate of opinions. And this just, to me, kind of got to the heart of what we keep hearing in, in the news about the expert opinion. Well, the experts say this, the consensus of experts. So we got to just do what the experts are telling us. And these experts, along with the mainstream media, are just producing exactly what Vogelin was talking about, this climate of opinion, where the opinion of the expert is the truth. It's not what you think, <laughs> you know, is the truth. <laughs> and so... Um, there were just a couple of good things, and if you go on to read the essay, and I'll put um, I'll put the links below to the essay uh, on classical studies, uh, as well as uh, uh, Dr. Romanello's essay uh, that describes it and goes in depth and in detail about it. Uh, those links will be below. Um, but one of the other ideas that he had in there that I really loved is this term uh, metaleptic thinking. And it basically just means that we all have a connection, a spiritual connection uh, to whatever it is that our consciousness is. And we're using our reason uh, to think for ourselves, but ultimately it gets to this place where you have to be thinking in metaphors and you have to be thinking uh, about things that are your 
personal experiences and your own thought processes that you can't really explain to other people. And I enjoyed that concept as well. So it's well worth checking it out on Classical Studies. Um, again, I guess I just want to thank uh, Julianne for coming on the show and having that wonderful conversation with me. And I think uh, hopefully we'll all uh, take some of this information away uh, and just be able to understand a little bit more about what's going on in the world right now and the fact that, you know, this uh, in, in Western philosophy, this has been going on for a long time. So <laughs> welcome to the machine, everybody. Uh, but you can find out more uh, about uh, Dr. Julianne Romanello's work at www.heartsforhexagons.com. That's where you can check out her stuff. And of course, you can go to Vogelinview.com to uh, find all kinds of essays and information about Eric Vogelin. So I'd recommend checking that out for everybody as well. Um, seems like a really cool guy, and I'm glad I got to know some of his philosophy from the mid-20th century there. And of course, as always, uh, you can go to www.theshiftnow.com and uh, check out a lot of free content I got going on now. I've got uh, old Thursday morning reports from the radio station here. Uh, I've got roundtable discussions. I've got the new show Behind the Line. Uh, and of course, the Psychology of Lockdown series, as well as uh, The Shift, of course. Um, so all of that will be up at theshiftnow.com, uh, where you can also sign up for the newsletter. I like going for the email list because we can kind of bypass the, the big tech and the third-party platforms uh, all together. Um, so you could sign up for the newsletter there. Or, I, of course, you can find me at The Shift on Facebook. My personal page, actually, I've been using a lot. So just look up Doug McKinty on Facebook. It's The Shift on YouTube, at McKinty uh, on Twitter. So thanks, everybody, for checking this one out. And uh, we'll be back again next week with Episode 75. Take it easy. 